Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cedar Woolley Rotary Club, the greatest Rotary Club in the... Thank you. Whoops, I forgot again. Where, when we begin our work, we decided that we would not be afraid of failure. If we think something is worth doing, we make an all out effort, even if we don't have any assurance at the beginning that we'll be successful. Today's invocation is by Teak. Uh, I pray for our lost Rotarians uh, last year and their families, and we pray for uh, our health. Uh, thank you for our service opportunities, both local and uh, international. Uh, amen. Thank you. Please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Four-way test, is it true? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Today's song, uh, I think is Mr. Yeah, McCann. It's, it's mine, I, the, the, the day the role of David Bricka will be performed by me, so. Um, I thought about what to do in the last minute or five that I've had this. So I think we're just gonna do You Are My Sunshine because we all know it and it's uh, kind of a gloomy day. So you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy with skies of gray. Mother of Germans, which I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have any visiting Rotarians? Okay. Do we have any guests of Rotarians today? Everyone who wanted to stay inside. Okay, thank you. Uh, time, time for a little bit of club business. We don't have a lot today. Monthly teams. Captains, be thinking of what you're going to do because the snow's going to go away sooner or later and we can all get to work on that. Um, there's a board meeting next Tuesday, January 11th, over at uh, Janicki's uh, offices. And that's at 5.30. Everyone's invited. Uh, come on by and see what we do. Uh, Teak, you had an announcement? find a, a microphone here is uh, my voice doesn't carry through a mask. Yeah, I wanted to give uh, everyone a little update on uh, what our club is doing in uh, international work, specifically the International Project Alliance that you'll remember is a uh, local group of 10 uh, local uh, rotary clubs and uh, specific, uh, more specifically on the Adopt the Dream uh, uh, program. Yeah, the uh, IPA uh, works in Copan Ruinas uh, in the mountains of uh, Honduras and uh, serves over 1,700 uh, students in uh, primary school and uh, kindergarten. And the uh, last few years, uh, we have an Adopt the Dream program, otherwise Adopt the Student, so the students can go to uh, middle school in uh, Honduras, unfortunately, the government just pays for the uh, teachers for primary or grades one through six, which, uh, as uh, we might suspect, isn't uh, nearly as much education as the uh, kids need or would like. So uh, adopt the dream students have to uh, sign up and we're getting to more and more strict criterion for who will take to take the best and the brightest and the ones that will stay in the school and not drop out. And uh, our club uh, has, uh, with our generosity, has supports 15 uh, secondary students, which move on to high school too, if uh, they're good. 
and a few even off to uh, college. And uh, we have uh, sponsors. It's your generosity and you know who you are that have uh, helped out these middle school and high school students. And uh, unfortunately, the bills come uh, through before their school year starts in uh, February after coffee uh, picking uh, seasons. Most of these kids uh, for December and January are out picking uh, coffee to make money for the year for uh, their families. And it's uh, $160 uh, for a year for uh, what they call secondary school or middle school and uh, 280 for uh, high school. So it does go up. And uh, we're hoping that uh, the people that are sponsoring students would continue and that uh, other people would be uh, interested in uh, talking to me about the uh, sponsorship of uh, students. And uh, I figured out uh, approximately if I started sponsoring a student in seventh grade and they made it through high school, that's left less than $1,500 uh, for all of middle school and high school. And uh, I'm sure our uh, school people can tell us that's a lot less than what it cost in Cedro Woolley for uh, one year of school. So it's really a bargain and uh, changes the uh, students' uh, lives forever. We have a much better uh, computer generated uh, billing and information on what we're doing. I've been giving to the uh, known sponsors and I apologize for any confusion on the uh, bills in the uh, past. The system wasn't very good and uh, mistakes were made, but we're trying to get it all uh, online. And uh, you can find out more about the uh, programs and what the uh, IPA uh, does uh, on the IPA, just like the beer, but ipafoundation.com. And uh, uh, we are, the club also helps the IPA in construction projects and uh, grants, and uh, we've done quite a bit on our sponsor, a, a school for our uh, club sponsors, uh, all 78 primary school students and 18 kindergartners, and you'll see some of the little letters from the uh, students uh, floating around. Uh, so. Uh, we're uh, besides the middle schoolers and high schoolers, we're sponsoring over a hundred uh, village kids uh, school on the, the, for things the government doesn't give them, backpacks, uniforms, school supplies for them and uh, the uh, teachers. So all I can do is just say, uh, thank you for the uh, club support for our school, Carousalita too. Thank you to all the uh, sponsors for the secondary and high school. And it's, uh, I'm going down in uh, February, so I get to meet with a lot of these students. It's really uh, fun and I'm getting to know some families down there and keep in communication. So uh, it's a neat deal to uh, see what we're doing from our club in the international arena in uh, Honduras. So thanks for your time. I think it's a, a real worthwhile program. My uh, chief criminal deputy, Rosemary, who many of you know, uh, is in the Anacortes Rotary Club and she sponsors a kid down there and she gets regular letters from him and uh, she finds it very worthwhile and rewarding. So I'd encourage you to uh, join in. Uh, Tim, did you have something you wanted to talk about? So if you need a donation slip, they're readily available. We're all set for that. One thing regarding the different uh, donations, we're still taking them over to Styles and Lair offices and dropping them off there. Now, last year, John was great in allowing us a place to store all those items off the, off the Styles office area but we are looking for a place that would be more permanent, something that we could use for a long, long time that would be nice and secure and that we can really handle it. And I don't like leaning on John all the time, although he's always willing, but you know, what the heck. So if, if anybody has a good idea of a place where we could store these things, that would be great. 
We are going to have a auction meeting on Thursday night over at the library. I've got a, a meeting room reserved over there. So if you are interested in the auction, even if you are not interested in the auction, please come to that meeting. There are some important decisions that we have to make about what our plans are gonna be for this year. I'm still absolutely hoping that we can go ahead and have that live auction at the Heritage Flight Museum. Uh, there's no way that I, I just can't see us making as much money on a silent auction online as we can in a live auction. So I really want to pull that off. But there is COVID and we do not know what the heck that is going to do. And we will not know until just about the time of the auction. So we do have to <clears throat> make some potential alternative plans. And I'd like to get some opinions on how we might want to handle that. Okay, that's about it. Uh, Tim, what's the date and the time on that meeting? May 6th. No, no, the meeting. Next, meeting. Is it next week? <laughs> yes, next week, Thursday night. The 13th. Good. What time? Uh, I figure 6 o'clock. We've okay. got the room from 5 o'clock on, so I'll be over there. But uh, 6 o'clock would be a good time for it. Is that good for everybody, or would 5.30 be better? 5.30. 5.30? Very good. 5.30 it'll be. Okay, so I hope to see you all there. Uh, Carl? Sure. Uh, just letting you know that I've been working very slowly on, but it just came back to life, a, a global grant in Africa to do 20 wells in Burkina Faso. This is a different area of the country that we went to the last time, but it's the same Rotary Club that we would be working with over there. And we have a the Rotary Club of Marblehead, Vermont or somewhere back east is the sponsoring Rotary Club. And I was talking with Teak and we're gonna put a proposal in to chip in 5,000 to drill 20 wells the total grant needed is 288,000, so it's a big one. It'll be the biggest one we've ever done if we can get this thing to go. So we're, we're pushing it. Thank you, Carl. Any other announcements out there? Jeff. Hey, just that we're into January, which means I will probably be receiving scholarship applications here in the next few weeks. So if you're on the scholarship committee, keep an eye, keep an eye out. Thank you. Any other? Bill McCann. Just a, a note that we're working on trying to put together the quiz for the crystal ball, which I think is scheduled for a meeting on the 4th of February. And I'm soliciting proposed questions, not only from uh, committee members, but anybody else in the club who might be interested in submitting questions in the five categories. The categories are international, national, state, and local sports and miscellaneous. Um, we always seem to have difficulty coming up with good international questions. So if you're especially interested in that area, it would be helpful. And I'm, just email me whatever questions you have and uh, we'll be putting that test together in the next week or so. Thank you, Bill. Any other back there, Mark? A number of you asked me about the Paul Harris Awards. We haven't done those for a couple of years. Uh, and maybe not everybody knows what those are. Paul Harris is the founder of Rotary and uh, probably the most prestigious award you can receive in Rotary. And uh, normally uh, uh, prior to the pandemic, we would do four, five, maybe a year, some in a club and some out in the community. And, and um, for people that go above and beyond and put service above self. So I'm, I'm here to kind of foreshadow that in March or into February, we'll be asking you for nominations for that and to get those to me right now, if you have them, uh, not just a nomination, not just a name, but why that person would deserve a Paul Harris Award. And then when we do the induction, which hopefully will be in person in June, we will honor those 
people that uh, are Paul Harris Award winners. So just a heads up. Thank you. Any more announcements? Okay, we have the Wheel of Fortune, please. Jeff, give her the microphone, please, because I don't think anybody can hear. Okay, what do you got there? Do you want to spin the wheel? Okay. Okay. Twenty. Wait, we'll owe you one, John. <laughs> okay, well, Michael, take care of you there. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Jim, how are you doing today? Is that it? Yeah, I guess you're in charge. <laughs> Steve, so who could drop the money there. off it's with Steve at uh, Cedar Valley Auto Parts? Okay, Mark would take it. Mark will take it. Okay. So now. So, Sergeant at Arms. Sergeant at Arms. different states. So I'm gonna start in the back of the room and you have to tell me the state that fits this um, nickname. And it's the mother of presidents state. No. So two bucks a piece. The answer is Virginia. Oh, you did. I, I didn't hear it. Okay. So now we're going to go with the flicker tail state. The flicker tail. Not close. Mm -hmm. So that'll okay, two bucks. Ah. North Dakota. But you could have also been the Peace Garden State or the Sioux State, but I picked the most obscure. Okay, guys. <clears throat> That's your choice. Yellow Hammer State. Nope. No guesses there. It is Alabama. This is also known as the Cotton State. Uh, 
Okay, so we'll come over here. Your clue is the battle born state. Battle born. Nope. It's also known as the Silver State or the Sagebrush State. So now we're going to go with um, the yellow the yellow hammer state. Oh, we did that one. Okay. Uh, So let's just go with the sugar state. That is correct. should be able to answer this. If not, then it can be Eric to fill in, right, Eric? Okay, what is the Chinook state? Yeah. Easy as it gets, Senator Wagner. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's do happy bucks. Anybody want happy today? So uh, yesterday we celebrated Owen's fifth birthday. It's hard to believe that uh, he's been around for five years already. He's just about the happiest person in the world. Nothing gets him down. So here's to hoping that he can hold on to that for a long time before he... Uh, becomes a grumpy preteen. A hey, uh, happy uh, 10 bucks uh, for me and my wife. I always swore I would never get on an airplane uh, on a holiday and uh, held that up for 20 or 30 years until uh, this year to go to Menlo Park to see my older boy and family, you know, with COVID and uh, snowstorms and holiday traffic. And lo and behold, we made it to, Menlo, to San Francisco and back with no big holdups, uh, no snowed up flights. I mean, flights on both sides, days of us were all canceled. So a miracle, so I, I might reconsider uh, not going any place on a holiday on an airplane. Thank you, Pete. Nick, anyone else happy around here? Up here. Aha, uh -huh. Senator Wagner. Well, the first 20 is 20 that I already owed from my virtual happy bucks before, and there's a, another 20 uh, to, to be back here in person with you today, I've spent quite a bit of time out of state this year, and uh, it's just wonderful to be home, such as it is. Although I uh, take a little exception, Rich called me up about an hour ago and said, can you be the guest speaker? So I don't know if I'm happy about that, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Well, you're not the only one. I, I recruited uh, Chief Wagner as well. 
Okay, John. So uh, we have a lot of different projects that uh, are potentially can happen this year. And so we are looking for property to, uh, to, do, to do this work uh, last summer. And uh, the old Safran building up in Bellingham, um, uh, they're moving out of there. So there was, it's 200,000 square feet with 50,000 square feet of office. And, um, and we bought that building in December. And so we're gonna have a, a Janicky North uh, place up there, but we're not leaving Skagit County. We're, to invest it here, but so if you hear people about um, you know having a shop up there, that's that's the deal. We bought the old Saffron building, yeah, right next to Barkley Village, yeah, twenty eight acres and and all that kind of stuff. But it's really uh, uh, designed for aerospace work. It's got a, a five thousand square foot freezer for pre preg, and it's got a bunch of ovens and. Um, it's all got, you know, vacuum systems and air systems and all that kind of stuff. So should be good and not too far from an airport. I don't need an airport. Anyway, okay. Thanks. Congratulations, John. I have a couple of things to report. I meet a group of girls in the morning in Clear Lake to walk and Sue was in Yakima so she couldn't join us but Katie and I sat out yesterday. She got out of the car and found four $100 bills, crisp bills on the ground. And she gave me one and we went on our way and she texted me later. She said, I think they're counterfeit. And they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we thought we had a real find. And then my... <laughs> My, my second happy buck is um, I sold a house up on FNS Grade Road to a bachelor and his teenage son. And I should have checked it before we closed, but I didn't have time and it was snowing. Unfortunately, the agent called me last night when the buyer went there, he took pictures. He said, this place is a mess. I said, oh dear, well, I'll come clean it tomorrow. So I got Randy, luckily he's willing to help me. I spent three hours on the fridge. There was dog hair and bugs in it. It's totally gross, but we're getting it fixed. Oh, that's cool. yeah. <laughs> that's a Randy. Yeah. Becky, I'm wondering, uh, we, were, we were talking about a counterfeiting case in the office the other day. You're not that person, were you? Okay. Pete said they were done in crayon. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we've gone from rags to riches and uh, pull up uh, emailed me and said our speaker that she had scheduled couldn't make it. And uh, so what do you do? You ask Rotarians and what do they say is yes. And she asked Frank to give a new member talk. I asked Keith to give us a little update on the legislature and what do they have to say? Yes, and so uh, we have, uh, we have two speakers. So Frank, you wanna come up and give your little speech, please. Well, thank you, Paula and Rich, for giving me the opportunity and thank you for not allowing me to go after Senator Wagner, because that would be a hard bill to follow. Um, so a little bit about myself, I've only been a Rotarian for I think five weeks now. Uh, pretty much uh, Cedar Willie almost all of my life. I was born in North Carolina. My uh, parents uh, met here in Cedar Woolley where uh, my father retired from Northern State. Uh, large family, seven sisters, one brother. I was kind of the afterthought. So dad retired right after I was born. Uh, graduated from Cedar Woolley High School in 1993 and uh, have lived here uh, with my uh, bride since uh, we got married. 22 years ago, January 16th, so coming right around the corner. Have two beautiful daughters. Uh, my oldest just got married this last Sunday. Uh, from 1994 on, I've been a part of the Cedar Woolley Fire Department. Had the opportunity to work for probably the greatest leader I've ever worked for in my entire life with Chief Klinger since 94, where I moved in and lived at the fire station downtown here. Uh, 
kind of worked my way rank, up the ranks uh, as a volunteer, always working on the side, uh, been uh, a manager for Target for 14 years, uh, worked uh, for the ambulance company here in town as a, as a part-time uh, employee just for fun. And in 2017, uh, Chief Klinger brought me on as a, a new assistant chief and worked under him uh, in a full-time capacity for the last four years. And he passed the torch on to me and gave me shoes uh, to fill that probably will never be possible ever again. Uh, but uh, amazing opportunity, great community, plan on being here for the rest of my life. Uh, love the, the city, uh, love the growth and the development that's happening and uh, I'm pleased to be a part of this group and thank you for having me. Senator Wagner. Any questions for me? Yes, sir. I have two uh, daughters. Uh, my oldest uh, just got married uh, this last Sunday. My youngest is uh, 16. She's doing the Running Start program uh, and uh, doing high school and college at the same time, working at Starbucks, both daughters. Uh, the youngest is Emerson and the eldest is uh, Avery. And they are currently sending me pictures from their honeymoon in Disneyland right now. Uh, my wife is Rachel uh, Wagner. Uh, she works for the United States Postal Service uh, for about 19 years now. Uh, she uh, works out of the LaConnor office out there delivering uh, for Shelter Bay in that area. She also graduated from Cedarley High School in 94. Jerry Gardner, uh, he was, uh, as you know, the, the former athletic director here at the school district uh, has uh, uh, been a volunteer lieutenant for us for the last 15 years, been with us for almost 18. And we just hired him this last uh, uh, June as our assistant fire chief, dealing with uh, uh, fire plans, fire marshal stuff and training division. Did he get your job? He, no, uh, he took on uh, Chief Todd Olson's uh, uh, job as he retired uh, in June as well. Here is your uh, commemorative pen for your uh, participation as the speaker and willing to step up right at the last minute. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, sir. Okay. Literally, it was more than an hour. It was probably two and a half hours before the meeting that I contacted Keith to ask him if he would give us a little update on, you know, what we might expect uh, from the legislature, heaven forbid. And, uh, you know, just tell you what's going on and be able to answer any questions or uh, maybe hear some concerns that you might have. So with that, Senator Keith Wagner. Well, thanks, um, Mr. President. You don't know when I checked that text, so it could have been minutes before. Uh, oh, thank you for the opportunity. Sorry, short guy. Um, first, I wanted to... Um, Thank Frank for giving his member speech. There's no nepotism involved here, although I do like to think I played a, a small part in getting Frank to the current position he's in. He, we wouldn't have done that if it wasn't for Dean Klinger's strong endorsement, but uh, we're so happy to have you. And I wanna thank you. Your daughter sent me a beautiful picture of her on her cheerleader stand, uh, one of the, squares that I sponsored and uh, she's just lovely and charming and, and thanks for sending me that photo. I'm gonna take it with me and put it on my desk in Olympia. So um, I guess I'm prepared for this because I just got off an editorial board with the Everett Herald um, just before this meeting. And, I'll, and I understand that, you know, we try not to be political here and I will, I will try to honor that um, but going to Olympia Friday afternoon, um, I think it's going to be a lot like the roads are right now, a bit of a sloppy mess. The four or the three areas that my side of the aisle will be emphasizing is public safety, 
putting some money back in your pockets and making our government a little bit more responsive to the people. So I'll start with the first one, the public safety aspect. And I wanna thank Lynn Tucker, Chief Tucker, for providing me with some information the other day, which by the way, Lynn, I've had an opportunity to use that twice. Since July 1st, when all the new police reform bills went into effect, crime has been at a runaway rate. And in our community, for example, auto theft since July 1st increased over 100% over previous years. I think that's a very good indication that there were some unintended consequences to the so-called police reform bills that were pushed through in the last session. And even the bill sponsors have said, we made some errors. So that will be uh, one of my priorities going to Olympia is to go back and fix those bills where they can be fixed so that our officers are confident in knowing that the state has their back covered when they're going out and doing the job. We're in a very difficult position right now, police officers are, when it comes to helping people. Essentially, and many of you may know I sit on as the ranking member on the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. Often the first step to getting help for people who are in behavioral health crisis or substance abusers, often the first step is contact with the police. That has been taken away uh, with some poorly crafted legislation in the last session, and people are just being left. And there's not anything our officers can do that um, meets the language of the law right now. It's a very sad state of affairs. People are suffering, our officers want to help, and they're essentially prevented from doing so. So that's one of the first things that I think is going to need to be corrected in this session. Putting money back in people's pockets. We're suffering economically um, in a lot of business areas. I'm sure you're aware of it. Working people are having a hard time. Gasoline prices are up. Inflation is up. But the state coffers are full to overflowing. We have an excess of $8 billion in our coffers right now. Some of that money needs to go back to the citizens. We need to undo some of the additional taxes that were laid on. I think there were close to 30 new tax increases, including things that are gonna cause uh, your gasoline to go up, um, utilities to go up. There was a tax on cell phones, um, uh, 40 cents, for every man, woman, and child who has a cell phone every month, forever, um, is imposed on people who can least afford to pay. And let's face it, everyone in the state needs a cell phone now to, to be part of today's society. I think I have a bill to undo that because we have the money now to pay for it outright out of our coffers. So it's time to return some of that. I've had a lot of questions from people about the long-term health care. It's been extremely unpopular to the point that the majority has decided to put it on pause for a year. Uh, my, my opinion is, is that's not enough. Uh, I think it needs to be repealed and rethought, not because I don't think people need health care, but because the way it was crafted is fis it's fiscally impossible to make it work right now. And we need to go back and address that. And the third platform, which was um, giving government back to our constituents, we need to go fine tune the governor's emergency powers. It's almost 700 days since the governor first invoked his emergency powers. And whether you agree with everything he did or you agree with nothing that he did, it doesn't really matter. The legislature has been taken out of government. So when people ask me what I'm doing, I have to say nothing because the governor 
through the use of his and their legal emergency powers. Make no mistake, the governor is exercising his powers legally according to the law. The law needs to be fixed because under the current law, only the governor can end an emergency. And we have a bill that would require after 30 days, every emergency powers act be reviewed by the legislature. And I think that's really reasonable because then when you come to me and say, Keith, what are you doing? I can say, well, we agreed with the governor on that. And we said, keep going. Or we disagreed, but not enough of us disagreed. Or we all disagreed. That's how the, our government's supposed to work. So those are the three major areas that I'll be working on when I go to Olympia. Public safety, putting some money back in people's pockets, and then making government more responsive to you. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. I've been taking them all week, so hopefully I have good answers for you. Mr. Janicki in the back. I, what I what I said, John, and, and everybody's confused on. So for a while there, they said the governor was going to say don't pay, but he doesn't have the authority because it's a law. Um, what I think is going to happen is there will be a bill um, sponsored by the Democrats to suspend the program for one year and refund any money that gets paid. So maybe it's easier just not to pay it. So you don't have to go through the repaying paperwork. That's my guess. Expect us to send the money until March. So hopefully you guys will have it figured out by then. But our, we're going to go ahead and collect it from our employees because it'd be a lot easier to pay it back than to try to figure out later on to collect it a whole, you know, double and triple if we have to. So we're going to take it out now and then refund it once the once the uh, bill has been put on pause, if it is. No, we're not gonna give it to the state. State doesn't expect it until March at the earliest. So we're not gonna give it to the state. We're just gonna keep it in house. Okay, and, and, and that makes good sense to me. I wanna explain a little bit more um, some of the dangers of this program. It starts out at 58 cents per hundred dollars. It's a direct tax on income, but it's a flat tax, so it doesn't violate the constitution. The problem is the law requires it to start out at 58 cents per hundred on one January, and to be at 58 cents per hundred on one January the next year. But in between the 1st of January and the 31st of December, they can put it anywhere they want to make the fund solvent. So it can go up January 2nd to a much higher rate. Now, since, since it's been so wildly unpopular, I don't see that happening. And we're already hearing that there may be a suspension of it. I really think it ought to be repealed in total and that we go back and, and think, take a more thoughtful approach to it. Carl? No. no, nobody that I know of is, is has able to take benefits from the program because it hasn't started up yet. That's correct, which is another flaw in the program because if you pay in for eight years and then retire, it, you don't get to take anything. Got a question back here, hold on. Uh, so a couple of questions, since uh, the government is flush with cash, is uh, that money earmarked or is that just going into the general fund? That's general fund money. So yeah. it's $8 billion um, over the next two biennia in excess of what we had anticipated. And, and that is a great thing, especially when you couple that with what we believe will be federal infrastructure dollars coming. We have to be cautious with it, though. 
Um, one thing that I think needs to happen right away is that we replenish our what, what you call the rainy day fund, the budget stabilization account that we drew from. That should be replenished. We also need to be cautious not to take money that may not be continuous and, and put it to programs that are. So my preference, and I think a, a, a prudent approach is to put that money towards capital projects. Um, and, and you know that we're hurting in transportation dollars. Uh, we're hurting in money to fix our culverts for fish, fish passage. I think those would be some good uses of that dollars. And then a, a quick follow-up question. Uh, so my understanding is this is a short session, correct? So for those of us who are gonna be knocking on your door or zooming in, I'm guessing, um, what would you recommend as far as like, could you talk us through the process of the short session so that, you know, when we're coming to you, we're coming to you before deadlines or, or when certain things have to happen? Yeah, you're already too late. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, it, it will be a very compressed ske schedule. So it's a 60 day session. And the, the traditional intent of the short session is to make minor adjustments to the budget and programs to correct errors from the long session previously. My short time in the Senate, the short sessions have just been a crush and there hasn't been any discipline to reduce the amount of bills or the amount of spending that is done. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and I'll, I should paint a picture for you uh, of how government is actually gonna be worked on the floor in Olympia. A few, up until a few days ago, we had changed the rules. We had agreed with the majority party. They were going to allow full Senate participation on the floor with testing every day before we went to the floor. Um, we were going to be allowed to have visitors in our offices in groups of three, as long as they were screened and escorted by security. Well, along comes Omicron and that has got a lot of people nervous. They, the, the majority rescinded that, changed the rules. It's essentially gonna be the same as last year. There will be 15 senators allowed on the Senate floor, um, eight Democrats, seven Republicans, four seats for leadership. So I'll be there as the minority whip um, in every session. And then we'll have three rotating seats on our side of the aisle. I understand the house will be almost entirely virtual. All committees will be virtual. There's actually some benefits to that because you can click on to, and you can get linked in from your home through Zoom and have testimony. There's a downside to that. Um, well, right now I have to look at all your eyeballs right now. It makes politicians a little bit nervous when there's a room full of people with strong opinions. And we have lost that over the, the last couple of sessions. So there's a benefit and I think we're gonna retain the good part. The, the Zoom meetings are good, but we wanna also get back to that personal option. It, it just, you just can't, you all know, it just doesn't convey feelings the same way that it does in person like we're doing now. Another question back here. Louis. Yeah, Keith, on the public uh, safety issues, what do you plan on introducing or what do you think the legislature will try to do to fix some of the wayward legislation that was adopted? Yeah, well, the first thing is Blake. The Blake decision, uh, which essentially made it a free for all for drug use. We have to go back and fix that legislation. I hope that we get cooperation from the uh, other side of the aisle. There was a simple fix that the courts almost suggested to us. All we had to do was change the language to knowingly possess and then it would have fixed the problem. Instead, um, things got a little wild and it became this free for all, a situation where nobody's getting help, nobody's getting prosecuted, nobody's getting sentenced, 
nobody's spending time in our corrections facilities. And my emphasis is on the word corrections because a lot of correcting goes on in our correctional facilities that's not happening anymore. But another thing I'm working on is the back end because public safety doesn't end at an arrest or charging or prosecuting or sentencing. It ends when somebody goes to our correctional facilities. Um, there's punishment involved. That's for the victims and, and their families. But there's also rehabilitation involved. And we cut the budget knowingly by $90 million last session. So our correctional facilities are struggling. They don't have enough people. When you don't have enough people, the programs suffer. In some of our facilities, our inmates are essentially in lockdown, which is normally a punishment for bad behavior. They're in lockdown because we don't have the manning to treat them properly and get them their program. So their counseling suffering, their alcohol and drug programs are suffering, their physical health is suffering. They're even having hard times getting phone calls out because somebody's got to take them to make that phone call and we don't have the people. So I'm gonna work hard to get that budget restored. And then the follow-up question is, are you uh, at all concerned about what the governor may do when it gets to his desk? Well, the, the governor always has the ability to veto things. Um, he has to veto full sections. So the House and the Senate are in a lawsuit right now with the governor on what we feel is misuse of his veto powers. And that is a bipartisan, bicameral lawsuit. So it's not just Republicans being mad at the governor. I think uh, carefully crafted legislation either requires the governor to veto the entire bill or the entire section. And I don't, I don't know that what the governor's been frankly um, pretty fair when it comes to total legislation. I haven't seen him veto much. I've seen him picket sections that he doesn't like. I mean, that's the right of a governor, whether I like what he does or not. Senator, as long as I've got the microphone, I've got a question for you. Well, what are we going to do about my rest areas along I-5? Can we get those reopened? I sure hope so, because that's the one I want to stop at, the Arlington one, when I'm coming home and it's closed. Um, I, I understand the problem there. I would like to see the State Patrol enforce a little bit more strongly the kind of experience you like to have when you go into a rest area. It's a budget thing right now, but it also has to do with the number of uh, indigents and drug dealers who use those facilities. So they've become unsafe. Other states don't seem to be having the same problem. Um, maybe we should be asking them how they're uh, doing it. And you're right. Well, other states didn't have the Blake ruling like we had, which really threw a wrench into how our society is is dealing with drugs. And I don't think we did the state a favor with um, our inability to come to a good fix last session. Senator, you, um, you used the word prudent when you were talking about spending and, and the budget. What are you expecting to happen? Well, um, that kind of lures me into the partisan side of things where I like to stay out of because well, let's just say there's some really sharp people on the other side of the aisle and, and their best people are in charge of ways and means. So Senator Christine Rolfus, uh, Senator David Frock um, are two of the levelist most capable senators on that side of the aisle and they're not dumb. So I think that we have a good connection. We have to compromise and they have to compromise within their own party. So the, the Democratic Party is pretty polarized on the other side. You have people on the far left to moderates 
and they have a little bit of a membership management there where there's a little, some power struggle. And I see the, the moderates, the, the folks that I like to work with, um, are a little bit under fire and they have to satisfy both ends of it. So it's a tough job politically for them in Olympia. Go ahead. Oh, there's a mic. So I've been reading in the paper in a little bit that you're looking at possibly running for a different office, Secretary of State. I, in, in fact, I have um, made my submission to the uh, PDC, the Public Disclosure Commission, uh, to run for the office of Secretary of State, yes. But that, that won't be an official filing per se until May when all the other um, offices open up and you file your to run, but that's correct. <laughs> How does it benefit you? Well, you get rid of your that lousy senator from Cedar Woolley <laughs> if I'm successful. Um, I'm I want to avoid making this like a campaign speech for the office, but I think it's common knowledge that there's a, some very extreme ideas and about the secretary, about elections in Washington state. And that's only a small part of the secretary of state's job, but I know it's going to be the focus of any campaign. Secretary of state's in charge of corporations, nonprofits, LLCs. Secretary of state's in charge of the confidential um, addresses for victims of abuse and in charge of the archives, in charge of the library. There's over 300 employees in the Secretary of State's office. So it's really a, a, a management job, but I know that people are gonna focus on elections. And there's an extreme kind of opinion on each side. You're either over here and you say, the election process in Washington is perfect, and anybody who says otherwise is a kook. And you got the guys over here on this side who say the whole, it's total garbage and it's flawed and it's unfair, and, it, and those guys are wrong. I think the truth is somewhere in between. We have a very solid election system, but it's not perfect. And as evidence of that, every session that I've been in the legislature, there have been changes made by the legislature, um, both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats. To me, that's proof that we should always be um, constant improvement. It's like a software system on your computer. You get updates because people find flaws in the system and they want to abuse it. That's the approach I, I want to take as Secretary of State I want to satisfy people's questions. I think uh, if someone's asking a question, it deserves an answer, even if it's not the answer that they want. And I think the last Secretary of State could have been more proactive in, in answering some of these really qu crazy questions over here. I would have gone out and said, we investigated, we looked, nothing was found, uh, or maybe something is found. And here's how we're going to correct it. So I guess I'll just end there. Yes, Paula. Uh, you and the legislators from the 39th, the 40th, and the 10th will all be available at, 10 a, at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, via Zoom. And anybody that would like to participate, if they want to contact me, I'll give them the link. Yeah, I was, I was looking forward to actually doing that in our new library, but it looks like it can't happen. And, and I should tell you, Paula, I don't think Representative Eslick can make it. She's feeling under the weather and not uh, participating in a couple of things. Yes, Louis. You know, um, 
everybody's concerned about our fishing rights, but a lot of what goes on is out in our economic zone and not a state thing. I think it would be a great approach to try and engage the federal government to either energize our Coast Guard or our Navy and enforce our economic zone, but it's not really a state issue. We, we have to, to work the salmon problem in a lot of other ways that are more local. And I'll give you another example where most of us are in agreement that there's too many seals eating fish, there's too many cormorants eating fish. The tribes agree. Sports fishermen agree, commercial fishermen agree, and we are unable to make those changes in a meaningful way. We got a few permits to shoot seals, um, but because the federal law, the Marine Mammals Protection Act and the Migratory Bird Act, we haven't made much progress. And I think that has to happen at the federal level. I, for example, Canada, you can shoot cormorants on site as many as you want, no wastage rules, because they figured out that there, there's been a population burst of cormorants and they eat about a pound of fingerlings a day for every single one of them. If you ever took the Edmonds Ferry over, you can see 200 of those things just sitting on the pilings. We, we have a real problem with predators taking our fish and then they get out to see what you're talking about and we've got Chinese fleet, Taiwanese fleet, the Philippines, even the Canadians taking our fish and, it, and it's a big problem. All right, Rich is gonna save me. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And go down to there and sign some nice bills. So thank you, uh, Frank. Thank you, uh, Keith, for uh, your programs today. And thank you all for showing up in this terrible weather. If you can help uh, clean up, that would be greatly appreciated. Thanks. <laughs>